Welcome to the, this Liturgy of the Word of the first Sunday of Lent, Year C. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Filled with the Holy Spirit, Jesus left the Jordan and he was led by the Spirit through the wilderness, being tempted there by the devil for forty days. During that time he ate nothing and at the end he was hungry. Then the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to turn into a loaf. But Jesus replied, Scripture says, Man does not live on bread alone. Then, leading him to a height, the devil showed him in a moment of time all the kingdoms of the world, and he said to him, I will give you all this power and the glory of these kingdoms, for it has been committed to me, and I give it to anyone I choose. Worship me, then, and it shall all be yours. But Jesus answered him, Scripture says, You must worship the Lord your God and serve him alone. Then he led him to Jerusalem and made him stand on the parapet of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said to him, throw yourself down from here, for Scripture says he will put his angels in charge of you to guard you. And again, they will hold you up on their hands in case you hurt your foot against a stone. But Jesus answered him, it has been said, you must not put the Lord your God to the test. Having exhausted all these ways of tempting him, the devil left him to return at the appointed time. The Gospel of the Lord. I'm giving two homilies today on the first Sunday of Lent. One day, a little boy was in the market eyeing up a rather tempting display of apples on the fruit stall. Thinking the worst, the stall owner yelled, Hey boy, are you trying to steal my apples? Oh no, said the boy, I'm trying not to. We're not tempted because we're bad, but susceptible as we are to the effects of original sin, we're prone to find forbidden things attractive. Temptation itself is not a sin. Even though Jesus was not stained by the sin of our first parents like we are, he willingly took on board the whole gambit of our fallen state, which included temptation. The gospel today bears this out. After 40 days fasting, Jesus was vulnerable. As with Jesus, the tempter knows only too well our weak spots, where we're most likely to fall. We too need to know our Achilles heel so as not to be caught off guard. Now the first temptation is about satisfying the desires of the flesh. Eating too much comes to mind. Some live to eat instead of eating to live. That's why fasting is important. Others may have a weakness for shopping where their spending is out of control, even though the money they spend could be used far more sensibly. Other people can't control their tongue. The list doesn't end here. Lent is an opportune, an opportune time for confronting these demons. The aim of the second temptation is for Jesus, the miracle worker, to dazzle the crowd by throwing himself off the parapet of the temple and using the angels as a safety net. With some daring stunts like this, the people might acclaim him as a superman in the hope that it would go to his head and divert his gaze away from the less attractive offer the less attractive option of laying down his life on the cross. They say even the devil can quote scripture, which he does in this case. Some preachers 
Also, cherry-pick quotations of scripture, usually out of context, to present a distorted image of God as a superman who, with a wave of his hand, will iron out all the ruffles of your life. A kind of an abracadabra man. Now, this is the very image of himself which Jesus was loath to project. After certain miracles, he often made a quick exit into the hills to be by himself. It is in the very messiness of life which we find Jesus. He is concerned with the transformation of the inner man or woman to whom he gives inner strength, inner peace, and inner power to counter temptation. Jesus, however, was always many steps ahead of his rival because he knew his father's will only too well. So the devil couldn't get the better of him. The third temptation is where the tempter offers Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. Here he is exploiting our weakness for power over others, which is often accompanied by pride in possessions. Jesus often warned the apostles against jockeying for positions of power. He told them to take the lowest place. Jesus didn't fall for this temptation because he knew, as he said to Pilate, that his kingdom was not of this world. Let us not become too captivated by the allurements of this world either. Our prayer and fasting during Lent will help us to see through the subtle temptations of the evil one. Willpower alone is not enough. Pray not to be put to the test. The spirit may be willing, but the flesh is weak. The second homily. The term Bible bashers is sometimes used of people who are forever quoting verses in the Bible, mostly out of context, to prove their point. Their overconfidence can be off-putting. You can stop them in their tracks by telling them, even the devil can quote scripture. That's precisely what he did today in the reading. He quotes Psalm 91, inviting Jesus to do something reckless by throwing himself off the parapet of the temple. Psalm 91 says he will put his angels in charge of you to guard you. But Psalm 91 never mentions throwing oneself off the roof of the temple. The devil added that to confuse Jesus. But he picked the wrong man. Yes, we have angels to guard us, but not if we do something bordering on the reckless. Jesus is in the desert for 40 days, wrestling with how best to be the savior of the world. And surely an excellent way to win people over is to do something spectacular as the devil suggests. What a perfect publicity stunt. Who could fail to believe in him after that? Here the devil is inviting Jesus to confuse <clears throat> two things. To do something which looks like an act of total trust in God, jumping off the parapet, but which in the cold light of day is utter lunacy. This was putting God to the test. Had Jesus jumped from the roof of the temple, he would have killed himself. There was no heavenly rescuer on Calvary. Why should there be one here? Some Christians are always chasing after the spectacular, the sensational, whereas God is to be found more or less in the ordinary. They give the impression that if you pray hard enough, for instance, God can send rain from a clear blue sky. 
That is the substance of the devil's second temptation, putting the Lord to the test. Many people who followed Jesus did so solely because of his miraculous powers. So as long as Jesus, as long as Jesus was enthralling the crowd by performing miracles, they would stick around. But they had no real interest in spiritual growth, only in the spectacular. <clears throat> when the initial excitement of the miracles wore off, they were no longer to be seen. The fact that Jesus so often tells people to keep quiet about miracles done on their behalf would suggest that he was continually living with the consequence of turning down this second temptation. Yes, Jesus did perform miracles, but only to lead people to a deeper faith in him. The devil in the second temptation is challenging Jesus to prove his credentials by jumping off the temple, believing he'll be held up by the angels. But paradoxically, if a Messiah needs to prove himself, he's not the true Messiah. The real thing needs no advertising, no publicity. When we're genuine, we don't need to go around proving it. It will shine through us. <laughs> Performing a spectacular stunt, playing the Superman, would imply Jesus was in, immune to human vulnerabilities. This would mean that he did not fully share our human nature, whereas St. Paul tells us that Jesus did not cling to his equality with God, but he emptied himself, becoming like us in all things but sin. So, there won't be any jumping off the temple, no publicity stunts which would dazzle the crowd. In line with his Father's will, it would be the arduous road of the cross or nothing. For him and for us, it's the only straight and narrow road which leads to glory. Thank you for listening and God bless you all.